Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Joanna Wedge and I'm with the Global Child Protection Working Group's Task Force on Minimum Standards or the CPMS as many of us know them. Um, it's wonderful to have so many people. I think the, the list is growing as, as we get started. Uh, to have so many people registered to attend to this first webinar on justice for children in humanitarian action. Uh, and a big thank you right off the start to the International Bureau for Children's Rights for organizing this webinar. As part of my work, uh, I've been overseeing an initiative to build the knowledge base of the child protection in emergency sector on three specific standards. Uh, physical violence and other harmful practices. Um, this is an effort that is led by Save the Children. Uh, there has been um, a survey and a review of documentation and, and interviews with key informants. And the main report uh, is being prepared as we speak and should be forthcoming um, at some point in July. Uh, they will, based on that report and recommendations and so on, there'll be some interagency follow-up activities over the next 18 months or so. The second of the standards that uh, we focused on was dangers and injuries. This review is currently underway, uh, just got started last month, and we expect to have the scoping report available in October, uh, prior to the annual meeting of the Child Protection Working Group. Um, if you have any experiences or documentation, documentation to share on dangers and injuries, it would be great if you could be in touch with um, the CPMS Task Force co-chairs of Save the Children and Terre des Hommes, or with the consultant herself, who is Alison Enyan, and I'll try and put um, her email address into the chat box. And then the third standard that we decided we wanted to take a more profound look at was on justice for children in humanitarian action, which is what we're here to discuss today. Um, a little bit of background. At the end of 2014, the CPMS task force commissioned IBCR to carry out an interagency scoping exercise on standard 14. The goal was to identify lessons learned, uh, promising practices, challenges at, at a variety of levels, uh, institutional, policy, operational, funding, and so on, as well as available technical expertise, whether that was in the form of tools and guidance, training, and so on, to prevent and respond to issues associated with justice for children in emergencies. So an interagency reference group was formed to guide the work. It included agencies like Terre des Hommes, uh, Penal Reform International, UNICEF and others, uh, IBCR and, and others. Um, and through a review of documentation, interviews with key informants and a survey of practitioners, IBCR pulled together a stock taking report and a summary for practitioners. And both of those I hope you've seen, especially the, the summary report, um, and they're available at uh, cpwg.net, the global CPWG webpage. As a follow-up to the review, the agency is now producing four case studies that complement the review. These are in Mali, Afghanistan, the Philippines, and Haiti. Uh, and I'm sure that Martin Nagler, who's been leading for IBCR and is one of our presenters today, would love to hear from any of you who can contribute insights to any of those locations. And, and perhaps we'll come back to that uh, a bit later in the webinar. Uh, IBCR has organized this webinar to introduce the, uh, the Justice for Children standard to colleagues who haven't yet been using it in their programming or, or using it not very much which brings us to the webinar and to the agenda of the webinar um, that's being crafted uh, and put together for us today. Now I was thinking, oh, who, who are we reaching out to uh, amongst so many uh, children in conflict with the law, juvenile justice practitioners, child protection and emergency specialists and so on. And I thought, well, perhaps people are joining us because you've been working on justice for children, but what you're working in an increasingly fragile context and want to be prepared if things start going wrong or more wrong, so to speak. Um, then I thought, well, perhaps there'll be some people who've been working on these issues, but they're interested in developing their career into the humanitarian uh, perspective. Um, or perhaps there'll be child protection and emergency workers who are increasingly seeing justice issues surfacing and need to know the basics about this standard. So whatever it may be that draws you here, welcome. Uh, to sharing this hour, hour and a quarter with us. And may you learn a lot today and feel free to contribute um, to this conversation as this uh, scoping exercise. And now this webinar is really starting to build some momentum around justice for children in humanitarian contexts. 
Um, IBCR has drawn together a wonderful array of perspectives for us in the webinar. Um, Martin Nagler of IBCR will start us off by walking through some of the basics uh, of the issue of justice for children in humanitarian action. Then we'll have uh, Francis Sheehan, who is a legal expert uh, working at the global level on children in conflict with the law. Uh, she has many years of experience in emergency and post-emergency contexts. And she will present on working within the continuum of development and fragile states or full spectrum programming, as some child protection agencies might call it. Uh, the third speaker is Kristen Hope, who is a child protection coordinator for the Middle East and North Africa, as well as Afghanistan and Pakistan with uh, Terre des Hommes Foundation. Uh, Kristen has over 15 years of experience working with children to help them express their voices. And half of these have been focused on vulnerable and marginalized groups in the Middle East specifically. So she's going to share with us her insights on informal justice systems in chronic emergency settings. Um, as I mentioned a bit earlier, uh, we will have a time for a Q&A after each speaker. And then at the end, we'll wrap up with a brainstorming and comments session on supports that field-based practitioners would like to receive. Um, as this interagency initiative moves forward over the next few years. All of your ideas in that last session will be captured and shared with the interagency reference group, uh, which will be meeting uh, over the next month or so to design a work plan going forward. Okay, I hope that's, uh, that's fairly clear of how we've come to gather today and what it is that we're hoping to share and discuss with you uh, over the course of the next hour or so. So with that, I'm going to pass the microphone and the floor over to Martin um, and share with you the screen so you can see his presentation. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for listening in. Um, and thank you, Joanna, for introducing this um, so wonderfully. Um, Justice for Children, um, I'm, I'm first going to run you through a little bit of the, the basic terms and processes uh, regarding Justice for Children, then talk a little bit about the international standards that apply in conflict and disaster settings, um, a little bit about roles and responsibilities, and um, then talk um, a little bit about the key actions that are foreseen in, in Standard 14. And we're going to round off um, by the, the challenges that um, we often find, uh, although I'm not going to go in, in much detail on that because the, the speakers that come after me um, will uh, shed light on, on some of these issues. Now, in terms of basic terms and processes, um, you, you will see the, the standard 14 on, on your screens, but I'm going to read it out for those um, that are joining on the phone. Um, standard 14 reads, all girls and boys who come into contact with the justice system as victims, witnesses, or alleged offenders are treated in line with international standards. And um, we can already see from that that Justice for Children recognizes that children can come into contact with the justice system in a variety of contexts, as victims, witnesses in conflict with the law, or even as part of the justice process, for example, in custody arrangements. Often, um, or most of the times, um, children come into contact with the law in a combination of these roles. Many are victimized first, um, and then come into conflict with the law as a consequence of those circumstances. So the main groups of, of children that we're talking about are children in conflict with the law on one side and um, uh, victims and witnesses on the other side. Juvenile justice, of course, refers to a system of justice dedicated to children alleged as, accused of, or recognized as having infringed the law and therefore only relates to part of the group included in the definition of justice for, for children. Um, the, the standard focuses a lot on children in conflict with the law, 
But um, just uh, as a reminder that uh, victims and witnesses are included in the standard as well. Now, apologies to those that are more familiar with the justice processes, but it's important to keep in mind um, each step of the justice process and the general principles or standards that apply. Um, because at each stage, of course, uh, a lot can go wrong and um, those dangers are um, maximized in conflict um, and, and disaster settings. The arrest is generally the point of entry to the justice system and um, it refers to the act of apprehending a person for the alleged commission of an offense. And in times of emergencies, uh, children are sometimes apprehended without legitimate grounds or by someone that is not authorized to do so. The right to see their parents or legal guardians within the shortest time after their arrest uh, is also frequently violated. And most importantly of all phases in the, in the juvenile justice procedure, it is during first contact uh, on arrest or immediately thereafter while in, in, in police custody that an accused juvenile is most likely to become the victim of torture and other forms uh, of cruel treatment. Interrogation or questioning should take place in a child sensitive way, of course, and be carried out by a person of the same sex, if at all possible. And um, presumption of innocence, separation from alleged perpetrators are just some of the rights that are frequently disregarded. Obviously, in the whole, uh, in all of the steps in the in the justice chain, we need to uh, differentiate between children in conflict with the law and victims and witnesses. Sometimes the procedures are the same, um, but um, uh, very often they, they are different, of course. Now, diversion refers to procedures outside the formal justice system and applies exclusively to, to children in conflict with the law. And um, this is something that is often either deliberately ignored in crisis or not pursued as a, as a priority. Pre-trial detention refers to um, the incarceration of the child after the arrest and before the verdict of a competent judge. And in emergencies, this can last particularly long if the system has failed to operate properly and can also affect children, of course, that have been detained before the emergencies, before the emergency. And um, alternatives to detention is something that is rarely considered in an emergency. Um, so again, um, a difference to uh, normal situations in inverted commas. The trial, of course, is the, the stage of the proceedings during which all the evidence is presented and assessed by a judge or a jury to shed light on the precise circumstances of an alleged infraction. At the end, there's either a verdict or an acquittal. And both during the interrogation and the trial, the child has the right to have legal assistance by a lawyer or competent person. And again, that's just one of the, of the rights that are um, frequently disregarded in in, in conflict. Now, the review undertaken on Standard 14 shows that during all emergencies, the number of child victims and of children in conflict with the law tends to rise significantly. But uh, according to practitioners, conflict and civil unrest have um, an even greater negative impact um, than, than natural disasters on, on uh, justice for children. Now, coming to the international standards that apply in conflict and disaster settings, mm. the CPMS are grounded in the international uh, legal framework that regulates the obligation of the state towards its citizens, um, with the main bodies of law being, of course, the uh, international human rights law, international humanitarian law, and refugee law. It's important to re remember that, that IHL, of course, only applies in conflict situations. Um, and um, 
the the Convention on the Rights of the Child uh, is is the main instrument, uh, even in this context, that 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 is relevant uh, in terms of uh, human rights law. And and the CRC contains several artic articles that specifically refer to to justice for children. But general safeguards, such as in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, also apply. So not just um, international law specifically um, applicable to children, but also more general. Then there is um, a lot of uh, soft law that is uh, not legally, but morally binding and um, provides important guidance. Um, again, there are several rules and guidelines that have been uh, elaborated and adopted by UN bodies that uh, refer specifically to children, like the UN standard minimum rules for the administration of juvenile justice, also called the Beijing rules, or the UN common approach to justice for children, uh, or justice in matters involving children as victims and witnesses of crime. However, most of these rules and guidelines are not specifically designed for emergency situations. And, and although they still apply in emergency situations, the implementation is, is often a lot more, more difficult in, in um, humanitarian um, circumstances. In terms of the roles and responsibilities, um, of course, the, the prime responsibility um, lies with the government and related institutions. Um, but humanitarian actors have a big role to play as well. Some of them have quite clear-cut mandates for justice for children. For example, the International Committee of the Red Cross um, is often the only um, one of the only organizations that is present in um, inaccessible areas or in, uh, in, in particularly dangerous areas. Um, it focuses on uh, detention visits and, and there the ICRSC pays particular attention to the treatment and living conditions of children. But the ICRC also has a very specific role to play with regard to children associated to armed forces and groups. Um, negotiating their release and and searching, uh, well, doing research for their re reunification with their families and, and communities. Another organization with a specific focus is um, UNHCR, um, because um, well, refugee law is 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 um, a particular uh, part of, of of the international legal standards of course and um, UNHCR and its partners aim to ensure that the national legal system including law enforcement and courts of law cater to the needs of refugees and other persons of concern. UNHCR works to ensure that persons are not um, arbitrarily arrested or detained and that decisions to detain or uh, extend detention are subject to minimum safeguards and um, in this regard, they, they pay particular attention to, to children. Um, one context where um, uh, there, there, there is often a problem um, is, is those um, states or those countries that have not signed the 1951 Refugee uh, Convention. Um, and, and although UNHCR's mandate is still applicable, there are sometimes um, some, some problems there. Um, I've just picked out these, these two actors, um, but the standards are intended for use by all actors working in child protection or related areas of humanitarian action. Um, uh, both uh, big organizations that are usually present uh, in, in most countries like UNICEF, um, but also international and national NGOs and, and other civil society actors. And, and that's why it's very important, like with all the other standards, to contextualize justice for children in each setting and to, to pick out those uh, issues that are of particular concern uh, with relation to, to justice in a specific context 
um, and also, of course, to adapt existing programs and projects to the emergency situation. And we'll come um, to that a lot more when speaking about the continuum uh, between development work and, and emergency um, humanitarian work. Now, coming to some of the key actions that the standard um, foresees, as all the other standards, there is a preparedness section and a response section. Um, and, and the preparedness um, section is ob obviously something that, again, is, is shared with, with actors working in um, development, justice for children obviously being an area that is also very important in, in um, de development work. And um, there it would be important to analyze the dangers faced by children, also regarding a, a potential natural disaster or, or conflict. Um, one of the things, uh, one of the preparedness actions is, is community-based education and um, to actively involve children in, in those preparedness activities. Uh, disaster risk reduction is, of course, a preparedness activity, um, and it is important to include justice aspects in that um, because it's not always, always the case. And, of course, um, building the capacity of relevant actors um, like police and, and justice actors. But, um, again, it, the question is how to make these um, uh, capacity building eff uh, efforts um, resilient to crisis and, and, and again that's something we're going to come back to. Response um, uh, is of course uh, monitoring data collection and mapping, uh, very important uh, in, the, in the first phase of, of an emergency to know um, what is going on and where um, interventions are required. Um, then effective case management um, procedures and, and referral of, of, of children and um, reducing risks, um, including advocacy, for example, in terms of um, landmines and um, ex explosive remnants of war. The standard also suggests um, outcome and action indicators and again not all possible indicators are mentioned explicitly in the standard that's again something that would have to be adapted from case to case by the the um, um, protection cluster or the subcluster on child protection to really see um, what indicators and, and outcomes are necessary in a specific context now, in terms of the challenges, um, as I said, I will only mention a few. Um, one uh, thing that has really come out during the uh, review process is this disconnect between the development and emergency programming, um, but also a big um, challenge to, to the implementation of, of Standard 14, and um, that has been mentioned again and again, is um, funding for justice for children in emergency settings. And um, one um, problem that we see often is that um, funding for, for justice for children would need to be long-term and um, emergency funding is obviously uh, very often more short-term. Um, and and the, the consequence is that, that it's, it's just often not a priority in the first phases of an emergency to look at justice related aspects, although most of the practitioners that that took a part in the in the survey um, said that it should be a priority in, in the first phases uh, of an emergency as well, maybe not all um, activities, but um, but at least some and again. Um, one question for discussion would be, should there be a checklist in terms of what are the priorities for a first phase of an emergency and, 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 um, and what are aspects that are better looked at maybe a little bit later on? Um, that is something that is not defined in the standard um, and again is probably depending on, 
on the situation. I'll leave it there. Um, we're going to come back to the um, to the other um, things later. Now maybe um, we can take some some questions and and um, on on this first part on the very basic parts. And um, if you want to um, ask a question, please um, press on interact and and raise your hand so that. Um, we can see who wants to to ask a question. Mm -hmm. Nobody so far. Martin, perhaps I could jump in because we had asked for questions to be submitted in advance, and I have one or two here. Okay. Um, one of them was, uh, one of the people wrote, are all the international guidelines, such as the Beijing rules and Riyadh and so on, applicable in humanitarian settings? You touched on this, but I wonder if you could go a bit more in detail. Sure. Um, yeah, as I said, I mean, most of these uh, rules and guidelines are um, written for any context. Um, so including emergency situations, but not very often not specifically referring how things might change in a, in a humanitarian setting. So um, one of the things that um, has also come out of the review and that, that we can discuss maybe in the, in the next steps is, is the question of, is it necessary to maybe not have additional rules and guidelines because there's already quite a few um, and, and they're all listed in the, in the full review report at the, at the end. But maybe that it's necessary to really filter out uh, out of all these rules and guidelines what is specifically necessary in in emergency context. So yes, um, the, the the standards and and rules apply, um, but very often there is not a, a lot specific guidance for for practitioners what to do in in humanitarian settings. Still, I'm not seeing any hands. So if you have another question that um, has been sent be beforehand, maybe we can take that as well. Yep, uh, we have one other one, which is around, again, you touched on this, but around key actions, are, are some more important or should we be prioritizing some of the key actions that are laid out in the standard um, rather than others when it comes to first phase response? Yeah, thanks a lot for that. Um, I mean, um, during the review um, and, and some of the interviews that we did, um, uh, sometimes there was, um, well, the view that, that some things that are um, applicable in normal situations are just not realistic to, to undertake in the first phase of an emergency. So, for example, to insist on on diversion might not be something that is uh, is realistic or possible in in the first um, phase of an emergency, which doesn't mean to say um, that that we shouldn't or couldn't, but it it, it might not be really uh, realistic. Whereas there is others that that should always happen in in the first phase, and and some of those um, points that have been mentioned there are regarding. Um, detention of, of children and and uh, monitoring uh, their their conditions and 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 so on and so forth so this is just an example that could um, be be in the first phase of an emergency and um, now um, yeah uh, again it would be something for discussion to maybe um, put up a a checklist or a catalog of things that should always be important in the in the first um, phase of an emergency. Now I see um, a hand. Um, I'm gonna unmute and then um, give the floor to Katya who has- All attendees are muted and may unmute themselves by pressing star six. So Katya, if you could click on the microphone button um, in order to be able to speak. Mm 
Mm -hmm. This doesn't seem to work, um, but you've put your um, question in the chat box. So does standard 14 include gender considerations in preparedness and response? Um, there's no specific um, mention of it, but um, obviously, uh, as, as all child protection actions, the, the gender dimension um, should, should always be, be taken into account, especially um, with, with regard to detention, for example, um, that, um, there is, um, that, that children are kept separately, that boys and girls are 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 separate and that the general um safeguards that that are in place in the international um in the international standards and in the rules and guidelines are applicable all right martin i think we better uh stop the discussions there and pass the floor on to the next speaker perfect so um thank you for that and and we pass over now to to Francis for the for the next um, discussion. All attendees are muted. Hello, everyone. I hope you're able to hear me. Okay. It seemed to take a very long time to unmute myself, <laughs> but I'm I'm sure you can hear. So uh, thank you very much, um, Martin and Joanna. Um, and thank you also for inviting me to talk today about some of the issues that can arise um, when programming for children in conflict of the law, when it spans across the continuum of development and humanitarian contexts. And really what I would like to do this afternoon is, is to reflect on, on one of the findings that Martin just identified from the, the scoping exercise around CPMS 14, that development programs on justice for children are often not very crisis resilient. Um, and conversely, in a humanitarian context, um, often because of the urgency of the response that's required, justice for children work is rarely seen as a priority. I think a, 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 another important finding of the review that, that Martin raised as well was that there isn't much research on this issue. So for today, I'll be, I, to a large extent, raising questions, I think, rather than answering them. And I hope we'll have, have a chance for a discussion at the end as well. Um, just a, a, a couple of points to... I do apologise. I inadvertently muted myself. Um, a couple of points to, to start with. Uh, first of all, just to, to make it clear that, that, as we know, the distinction between humanitarian and development context is rarely very clear cut. Um, you do get situations, of course, where a natural disaster afflicts a, a, a well-functioning state, um, for example, in the case of Japan and the tsunami that they experienced. But, it, but in general, and very frequently, the boundaries between the two contexts can be very blurred. Um, and in fact, I think it's quite interesting that, that Save the Children is, is moving towards what it calls full-spectrum programming. And by that, it means programming which is end-to-end, -end, which is inclusive of all contexts including humanitarian and development, the thinking being that this will help to break down the sometimes quite rigid distinctions between the two approaches. The other point I wanted to, uh, to refer to before getting um, into the question of preparedness, um, and again, I think it is an important part of the continuum and one that, that, that we're all familiar with when we work in, in the field of children in conflict with the law, is that so often they come from deprived and marginalised communities. And their exposure to crime, um, their exposure to the criminal system, it, it often reflects the failure of the state to protect or provide for them. And this is the case, I think, in, in both developed and developing contexts. There's a there's a blurring of the boundaries between children who commit offences and children who are in need of protection, children who live on the street, the children who uh, have mental illnesses, children who survive by selling sex or soft tissues or whatever it may be. And I think it's, it's, it's important to consider how 
this might change in the context of emergencies um, and indeed how in fact this might be exacerbated when already very fragile protection systems are at risk uh, or indeed have broken down entirely in the context of um, a humanitarian disaster whether it be natural disaster or, or conflict so for example you know large numbers of children may face situations which which place them in conflict with the law for tra trying to survive following a natural disaster by, by looting or stealing food um, children as we know are often detained because they've been engaged in protests lawful or otherwise and are associated with armed groups once they're they're in the system um, in the in the context of emergencies um, you know martin touched upon some of the violations of their rights that they can experience but you know, they, they can be ma manifold um, broad ranging failure to be separated from adults not having access to lawyers um, extended periods of pretrial detention, being arrested under the age of criminal responsibility and so on. So I would like now to um, move towards thinking about ways that you can build adequate resilience into justice reforms, um, the preparedness stage, if you like, but by that I mean something perhaps more broadly than we normally mean when we talk about preparedness i'm talking about the sort of um development aspects of justice reform what do we need to build into our reform so that they're robust enough to contend with crises um, and that they can provide children in conflict with the law that the protection they need in difficult circumstances when protection systems have broken down and indeed often justice systems have broken down um, and again, just to emphasize that these are really ideas for discussion. Um, they build on some of the actions which are already foreseen in Standard 14, um, and in some cases repeat some of them as well. But they're, they're, they're ideas for discussion and to flag up some, some future areas for research. So the, the, the first one of the um, first issues we can think about is disaster risk reduction. Um, and having policies which are developed, which are resourced and which are implemented, but which also include consideration of children in, in contact with the law and in conflict with the law. So really the justice sector should be an area that's considered um, when these policies and programmes are being developed. This will require some kind of assessment of potential risks that children in conflict with the law may experience as well as some kind of analysis of preventive measures that can be developed to mitigate them. Um, there's quite an interesting example in the Philippines at the moment. It's possible we have someone with us from the Philippines and it'll be very interesting uh, to hear their views on this later on. Um, but a, a number of INGOs, um, World Vision, Plan and Save the Children amongst them, um, we're, we're very involved in the response to the Haiyan typhoon and did a great deal of consultation with children, you know, in the immediate response and afterwards um, around how the typhoon affected them and around what they would like to be, what they would like to see done differently should this happen in the future. Um, as a result of this and, and work by many other actors, the Children's Emergency Relief and Protection Act uh, was developed. At the moment, it's, it's, it's pending in the Senate, but it seems to have gone really quite a long way through the Philippines parliamentary process. Um, and it's, it's, it's quite an interesting act in that it ensures that children are well prepared, kept safe, and their voices heard in any future disasters and emergencies. And specifically, it provides healthcare provision for children during emergencies. It uh, establishes a kind of accountability and responsibility system so that children's emergency systems are established in every city and municipality that, that's affected by the emergency and that they are responsible for coordinating the response for children. And there's, there's specific emphasis as well on, on the question of protection from abuse and exploitation in emergency areas. So I think that's just quite an interesting illustration, both of consulting with children and learning from them what they need um, in terms of emergencies, 
but also how you can build in protective aspects into disaster risk reduction law and policy. Conversely, it's important as well in terms of national plans of actions, which are being developed more broadly to think about emergency response as well. Um, I've also included uh, some legal aspects, and I think, as I say, I think there's a lot of scope to develop this, but these were, were some ideas which, which uh, kind of occurred to me whilst thinking about what would be really you know, fundamentally important to have within your justice system in terms of preparedness. But for example, advocacy around having uh, it specified in law that children are excluded from criminal responsibility for crimes committed when associated with armed forces or armed groups, or um, ensuring that children cannot be tried in military courts during emergency contexts. Um, I think the, the issue of capacity building of key actors is, is absolutely key. Uh, and as, as part of this, uh, I, I have a point about developing a strong network of defence lawyers. Um, of course, this may not be uh, appropriate in many different contexts where there, there simply aren't enough defence lawyers um, and or paralegals av available. However, I think the the process of developing a strong network of lawyers who are equipped and knowledgeable about children's rights and have the skills that are needed to properly represent children's rights can be an enormously effective protective um, uh, uh, facility to have at your disposal when emergencies arise and when children for example start to be arrested in large numbers in the in the context of civil unrest or of armed conflict and this this last point I have about shifting perceptions of children in conflict with the law, I do I do think is important. I think working with politicians, working with the media, working with civil society to move away from a knee jerk sort of negative portrayal of children in conflict with the law, um, an inflammatory rhetoric being used uh, for for political gain. But really working hard to ensure that there are positive portrayals um, of children in conflict of the war to to kind of counteract these very negative views that like this can help to lay the ground for a more benign response during emergencies. So these are just a few ideas around preparedness to share with you. If we move now to look at the uh, question of immediate response. We could have the next slide. That would be great. Wonderful. Thank you very much. So again, this is very much um, sort of it, it building on already envisaged actions under the um, standard 14. Um, there are a number of different actions that can be taken during an immediate response, of course, they're going to be very context driven, but there are just a few here um, to share with you. I think the question of preventing arrests from taking place uh, in the first place is quite an interesting one. Um, we had, uh, I had some experience in, in Cairo during um, civil unrest, during political protests, large numbers of being children being arrested. Um, and we had an experience where we gathered together a team of social workers, many of whom you know worked with children living on the street and, and already had relationships, individual relationships with them. Um, and during political protests where, which were you know we knew were going to happen, we knew that large numbers of children were very likely to be arrested during them. Having social workers on the ground, talking to the children, telling them about the, the, the dangers that they may experience, um, and giving them an alternative, explaining that there were shelters open in another part of the city where it would be a safe place for them to go to should they wish to. You know, it's getting the sort of balance between children's um, ability to express themselves politically, but also ensuring their protection. This was quite an, an, an interesting way in that particular context, which seemed to work relatively well. Um, as Martin alluded to, it's, it's, it's very important to have a, a clear picture, a clear documentation of where children are being held 
um, and the circumstances in which being, they're being held, um, documenting their own experiences of, of their arrest and their detention, of course, where it's safe um, for, for them to provide that information. Again, this question of provision of legal aid during police detention and afterwards is, I think, important. But of course, as we know, in so many contexts, this is a, a very difficult area, both in development, never mind humanitarian settings to, to work with. Um, and finally, the, the question of uh, monitoring and reporting. I think it's important to remember that even during uh, the first phase of responses, it's still possible to maintain that documentation, that monitoring, that reporting, and to share those findings with international and regional human rights bodies, such as the UNCRC, the UPR, and so on. So I have a, a quote up here from a 17-year-old arrested in Cairo, really just to sort of remind ourselves of how protections for children do very rapidly dematerialize um, in the context of, of, of emergencies and, and how you know, they can be dismissed so, so quickly. We could move on. And just to, to finish with some thoughts about the reconstruction phase, I think this can really be a great opportunity for uh, government restructuring and legislative overhaul to build back better and for reform of the justice system for children to be a part of that restructuring and legislative overall process. Um, I'm very much thinking about not just short term reform, but obviously mid to long term reform and very closely allied to that um, is this this question of funding which again martin uh, has already picked up on in in um and it comes across very clearly in the scoping study but but just to to emphasize this point that the the investment in preparation the investment in long-term reconstruction can represent very good value for money nonetheless as we know donor contributions are low particularly on the, the preparation phase. Um, I found uh, one analysis just, just this morning, um, which stated that less than 4% of humanitarian aid and less than 1% of development assistance is spent on disaster prevention, preparedness and risk reduction. And that's you know not just to do with justice reform, but, but generally speaking. Um, so we have the situation of a kind of false dichotomy of funding cycles, the, the humanitarian and the longer term development funding. And this lack of continuity and consistency um, can impact on long term justice for children pro, uh, programming. Um, and just with a final thought about the possibilities and the potentials for advocating for having a kind of funding pot which isn't subject to those kind of constraints. So I will conclude there. I may have gone over my time and I apologize, but just to, to emphasize that there's a lot of scope for, for still for testing and building the evidence base, I think, for effective programming, looking at how the, the continuum between development and humanitarian contacts interacts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francis, for this extremely interesting um, presentation, and thank you for going into a bit more detail on 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 quite a few of the of the points. Um, so we'll now take a couple of questions, um, and we'll try again with the question and answer mode. All attendees are muted and may unmute themselves by pressing star six. So if you could just um, again please show your hand uh, via the interact button at the top if you want to ask a question. Maybe in the meantime um, I can jump in because I think one of the things that was extremely interesting was this question of building up re resilience and you mentioned quite a few aspects of it Francis but um, how can we build up um, evidence or lessons learned um, to, to see what really works in terms of building up resilience. And, and um, if you could just say a couple of words on that before we take um, 
uh, another question and I can already see one hand there, but if you could just say a couple of words on that, please. I think it's it's really difficult. We're all in our work. Um, it's a, a, a very a not as engaged in documenting our work and evaluating our work as we could be um, in many different aspects of it, I suspect. But I think that uh, this is an area which is particularly hard done by in terms of documentation because you're 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 working in an emergency. Um, the the your priorities are. Uh, to, to provide an, an emergency response and to act with, with urgency. Um, so just to, just to reiterate that I think it's really important that we also have in our mind the importance of documenting and documenting programming in these contexts. Okay, thank you. I'll um, take um, Sarah Matger now. Um, I'll try to unmute you, but if it doesn't work, um... Let me just uh, read out the question that you've kindly put in the chat box. Um, engaging with the police or security forces can be very challenging. Are there any examples of best practices for uh, incentivizing police officers participating in capacity building initiatives? Um, I wish I did have some very good examples of best practices. Um, I think I would have to go away and look into that some more. Um, there are none which spring immediately to mind, unfortunately, and I agree entirely with you that it can be extraordinarily challenging um, engaging with both those um, organisations. Um, the Save the Children Sweden was involved in a very long term program training of the military in West Africa. Um, and there was some quite interesting uh, analysis of that. It was a really it was really quite a long term program. And it went, you know, uh, as I understand it, it's 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 ongoing. But it, it was a question of, of 10 years or so um, training up the military. So. There, there might be some quite interesting uh, kind of conclusions that they came up with about how to approach it and so on. But that was done in very much in the preparedness phase and not in the immediate response phase. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I, I could see, Sarah, that you unmuted your microphone. I, I don't know if you have a follow-up question or if we, um, we should probably move on. Um, just to say the the program that you uh, are referring to um francis um it's something that the ibcr has been continuing together with save the children also in capacity building for um peacekeepers or peace support operations in the african union context so that's certainly one aspect of that capacity building and and um that um, yeah, in, in national programs to build the capacity of, of police officers and, and, and others, um, this uh, crisis preparedness should definitely um, be taken into account. So um, I think uh, we need to move on because we have our, our next uh, speaker. So um, I'll turn off the question and answer mode. All attendees are muted. And I give the floor to Kristen Hope. Hello. I hope you can hear. I don't know if you can hear me now, but again, thank you, Martin. Thank you to IBCR and the Child Protection Working Group for hosting this event, um, organizing it, and also inviting me to speak about some of the work that we're doing at Terre des Hommes, specifically in the MENA um, and Afghanistan-Pakistan region. Before I start, um, I'd like to share an anecdote with you, um, which is from one of the countries where we work um, in Palestine um, and in Gaza specifically. Um, last year, during the, um, the 2014 summer war in Gaza, um, over 30 boys 
uh, at the time that the war started, were being held in the only juvenile rehabilitation center in Gaza, which is called Al Rabia. And these boys, most of them were pending trial, but some of them were convicted for crimes and are serving sentences. Um, Tabazam works in Al Rabia Center for, for boys. And when at the start of the war, um, all of the boys who were detained there were released back to their homes because the government of Gaza, led by Hamas, acknowledged that any public buildings, any governmental buildings, were potential targets um, of the uh, Israeli uh, in offensive. At the end of the 50-day war, all of the children who had been released from Al Rabia returned to the rehabilitation center. Not one of the children was missing. Now, on one hand, this isn't very surprising, given that the siege of Gaza has rendered it into a de facto open air prison. So children could not really have fled far away, even if they had wanted to, because the borders are closed and uh, you can't swim very far. Um, on the other hand, this example actually reflects some important points that I feel speak to the heart of our discussion today. The first being that in times of conflict, the well-being of children in conflict with the law, children in detention, and also child victims and witnesses does need to be taken into account. Um, and the second point is that formal settings of detention are only part of the picture. Communities also play a role. Um, for those of amongst the audience who may be seasoned protection professionals, the importance of communities um, in, in child protection um, is nothing new. But today I'm going to speak more about how these ideas are relevant to our discussion of access to justice for children and in humanitarian contexts. So going to the first slide, um, <clears throat> Uh, I wanted to speak a little bit about the language that we use when we talk about this. Um, so yes, and also um, child-friendly approaches to justice. Um, this is what Taoism uh, advocates for, which means that justice is adapted to children rather than just to adults. And um, Taoism also um, speaks about thinks that this should be seen in a holistic way, and that programming should involve both the formal justice actors who we've heard quite a lot about, so police, prosecution, courts, um, at the various stages that Martin um, spoke in detail about at the beginning. But we also feel that um, access to justice should for children should also take into consideration informal, customary and alternative dispute resolution mechanisms and processes. Um, why? Why is this important? Well, first of all, um, some we have some statistical hints you can't call it evidence but that these processes are very important specifically in developing countries if you look at unodc um, statistics for children coming into contact with formal mechanisms they're much lower so coming into contact with police for example much much lower in developing countries than in developed countries so you know what does that mean does it mean that children in developing countries do not commit crimes as much Probably not. It probably means that something is happening somewhere else. Um, and actually, Danida uh, estimates that between 70 and 90 percent of all disputes are solved through informal and customary mechanisms. And that's all disputes, not just for children. Also, there is um, um, a momentum sort of around in child protection uh, circles around community based mechanisms for protection um, and um, and so what we're talking about, what I'm talking about today also is sort of in line with this momentum, but it's also in line with the United Nations guidance for justice for, um, for children. Um, the 2008 guidance note actually says that children will often find, um, you know, community-based mechanisms, uh, traditional or customary actors um, to be more closer to home and more, they will feel more comfortable dealing with them than with, you know, um, say formal actors affiliated to the state. Mm, moving on to the next slide, um, what what do we actually, you know, again, what do we actually, what language do we use when we speak about this? I've been using the term IJS, which is for an acronym for informal justice systems, but there's also customary justice, traditional justice, um, and also ADR. Uh, different organizations use different terms, um, the UN, seems to be more comfortable with IJS. Um, other people such as IDLO, the International Development Law Organization, are more comfortable with customary justice as a term. Um, they 
there are pros and cons to each. They Some are wider, for example, informal justice systems could be seen as an umbrella term, where something like traditional justice or customary justice may be um, more specific. But overall, they do refer to these individuals, mechanisms and processes that are outside the scope of the state. Um, and when we use the terms, um, obviously there needs to be conceptual consistency, what exactly are we talking about? But I also believe that there needs to be flexibility um, and sensitivity to the context. So for example, in certain contexts, actually the term informal justice is not appreciated by the actors themselves because they, they see it as maybe undermining their roles. Um, and it also could, another critique of that term is that it could actually reinforce the sort of dichotomy between on one hand formal and on the other hand informal, which could actually be counterproductive. And I'll talk a little about that later. But um, the available evidence about these systems is that they can be positive, so they can be quick a lot faster than, um, you know, uh, formal justice mechanisms, which, you know, especially if they're overburdened, may take a really long time to process cases. They can be inexpensive, they can be closer in terms of language um, to com in communities where there may be, um, you know, a lot of linguistic diversity. Um, there's some claims that they can shift the uh, emphasis from blaming and punishment towards more restoration and repair. I put a question mark here because it's not always the case. Um, importantly, they could be complementary with formal mechanisms. They don't have to be mutually exclusive. And for, for us today, um, they can be more readily available in times of crisis, whether that's war, natural disaster, when the formal system may be weaker in general, but also the justice system specifically, as we heard um, very clearly from actually the, both Martin and Francis in their presentations. But of course, there are a lot of negative points. Um, so um, there are many concerns about um, due process, accountability, um, consent, uh, voluntariness of participation. There can be concerns about the partiality uh, or you know, is, impart is impartiality respected? Sometimes it's not. Sometimes the actual arbitrators can be partial to the parties. And also, it's, this is a point I think is really interesting that I'll come back to, which is about communities that are also contested spaces. They're not homogenous. They are places where there are multiple groups, multiple actors with different interests um, and that may be competing. Uh, so what does that mean? Um, and there's also a gap in the research and the use of these systems specifically for children. Um, I mentioned previously about the, the how this sometimes links, the discussion about informal mechanisms links with community-based protection uh, discussions and um, some of the concerns are about, you know, how does the, the will to protect community harmony and to restore the damage done to the community possibly compromise the rights of the individual? So a good example would be a case of, uh, you know, sexual abuse, which in some uh, contexts, specifically in the MENA and Afghanistan, Pakistan areas, uh, is considered a moral crime. Um, whereby uh, the harm done to the community, that the threat to the community harmony um, is prioritized. So we, the, a, a council can be gathered. Um, we would like to, to resolve this problem. And a lot of the resolution that's happened to sexual crimes um, is marriage. So the, the victim will marry the offender. This happens for adults and for children. So in the case of marriage, the solution that's given is... Um, to, to again solve the harm to the community, but at what expense? At the expense of the rights of the individual. And also, there are some questions about you know reinforcing power relationships. So, for example, if we work with uh, senior members of communities, community leaders, people again with maybe vested interests in keeping their positions, are we not actually just reinforcing power relations, gender relations? Um, and uh, again, these questions are being raised in by community-based protection um, discussions. So I just also like to look a little bit more at um, the links between uh, pr protracted crises, humanitarian crises, and the, our understanding of justice. How do we understand access to justice in these contexts? Um, first of all, as Martin said, we I think it's really important to remember that we're not just talking about children who are 
accused of committing a crime, but also victims and witnesses. Oh, I realize I'm going over my time, but hopefully a few more minutes um, and I'll be finished. Um, <clears throat> So victims and witnesses, as well as offenders, I want to give an example of um, early marriage, which um, is not often seen as a classic juvenile justice issue, because it doesn't necessarily involve a child offender. But in many ways, early marriage goes to the heart of access to justice for children. Um, and I'd like to, I mean, for example, Syrian refugee children in Jordan and Lebanon. These are children who, as the Syrian war enters its fourth year of conflict, um, people who have been refugee communities for over three years. Um, a lot of the protection concerns that are being raised in this context, amongst the main one is early marriage, girls are being married off to reduce the economic burden of families, you know, refugee families who are finding it difficult to survive. Um, and um, and many other reasons, but that's often a reason that's given. But the idea of uh, so the, the link between early marriage and justice is that first of all, the child who is married is the victim of a rights violation. So this can be seen as an access to justice issue that child should have a right to have re redress for this violation. And also importantly, the actors involved in arranging the marriage contract are the exact same people who are involved in alternative dispute resolution or in uh, marital disputes and issues of um, divorce or inheritance or custody and also sometimes for criminal disputes that are resolved at the community level for theft um, for fights these same people are involved so when you look at the issue through an access to justice lens you can start making links between classic protection concerns and processes of dispute resolution that fall um, into a more you know justice space mm -hmm. and building on this example i just want to you know throw out there the idea that when we look at individuals who are facing hardship and humanitarian crises, we can't consider them in isolation from culture, from custom, and from their perceptions of justice. So customs, yes, they're deeply entrenched norms, but they're also, his they're not historically static. They have changed over time. So as populations move, social structures move, religious actors, tribal leaders, community leaders, their value systems move expectations move. Um, again, this, this importance of community harmony, this will also move. Um, and so forced migration and humanitarian crisis can also result in a movement of these community-based justice systems, um, which won't stay the same. They will also change and adapt um, as they've moved. So all of this to say that I, we feel that access to justice is really relevant to, to basic concepts of safety, security, and protection that um, in, in humanitarian conflicts, you know, where do you go when you have a problem? Who helps you solve that? Um, the, I think these are questions we can ask to communities. So moving to the next slide and about the questions that we can ask ourselves. Um, you know, do we as humanitarian actors have our eyes open to these forms of community-based dispute resolution? Um, when we're, you know, as, when we're doing our, you know, rapid analysis, situation analysis or whatever, um, are we involving IJS and ADR actors in these? And are we consulting them when we're designing responses in emergency uh, protection programs? Um, I think these are, it's very relevant to be asking ourselves these questions at this stage. Um, and I think that Martin's work as well uh, on the, the minimum standard 14 is also, um, it's been great because it's sort of incorporated some of these reflections. Um, obviously, there are challenges. Um, there is the risk that harmful traditional practices and punishments um, that are used in informal justice may um, may continue. Um, there's, uh, and this is also, this is obviously a risk that is not, that, that you can try to counteract by um, actually making these processes more in line with international rights standards. Um, the government of a country may feel undermined because you're working with sort of informal actors and there may be cultural perceptions of childhood that can restrict participation and um, children's best interests. But at the same time, there are some promising practices. Um, there's um, se several theorists are trying to think about access to justice in hybrid models. So formal and informal um, systems completing each other 
um, one particular academic, Ali Wardak, who's done a lot of work in Afghanistan about this. Um, and, and then therefore favoring coordination between formal and informal, trying to bring informal um, actors practices in line with right standards um, through raising awareness about child rights and about restorative processes. Mm. Um, it's also really important to open up space for vulnerable groups women, children, minorities, to express their opinions about dispute resolution and share them with decision makers. And this helps us to counteract that risk that I mentioned earlier on about the reinforcing the social hierarchies. Um, and overall, as Francis said, and as I totally agree with, you know, re ongoing research and data collection are essential. So thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to share with you a last photograph of some Malek, so these are sort of tribal elders in a um, IDP camp on the outskirts of Kabul who have been living there for 20 years. They were displaced from the provinces through um, you know, the various stages of conflicts in Afghanistan which have ranged over four decades. So um, they, and we're working with them on this issue in addition to other protection issues. So thank you so much for listening and please I'm interested in your questions. Thank you so much, Kristen, for, for, the, for this interesting presentation. Now, um, we are a bit short of time, but um, please, again, if you, if you have a question, um, could you raise your hand? Um, All attendees are muted and may unmute themselves by pressing star six. And you can unmute yourself um, when... Um, pressing on your microphone button. So um, any any questions from anyone or also in the chat box? Or else maybe, um, Kristen, I, I, I could ask you, um, in terms of, um, I mean, you talked a bit about custom and culture and, and um, um, actors that may agree to modify their practices in line with international child rights standards, which obviously they're often not. But um, I guess this um, really takes a long-term work and trust building over a longer period of time. So do you think this is something that is, is possible to respond to in an, in an acute emergency or crisis? If you could say a couple of words on that. Hi. Um, sorry, I muted my mic. Uh, yes, thank you for the question. Um, my response to that would be that, um, yes, trust building does take time. Um, but I, I think it also it, it, it reflects, you know, how people think about um, response, humanitarian support, um, and, and how we think also about agency of the people that we, you know, come to aid the aid to or claim to come to the aid to. I mean, there's a very interesting report recently by, um, I think it was oh, awful confusion, but either MSF or MDM, sorry um, for that confusion, but um, about um, what do people in, you know, who have received support from, um, you know, emergency actors, what do they think about the support they received? And also, this has also been part of a process for the World Humanitarian Summit, you know, going to receivers of aid. And I think overall, the overwhelming thing that I find is that um, people, individuals, communities do not like being seen as passive receivers of support. But I, so I think that, you know, they should be seen as actors, as decision makers. Um, you know, obviously, if people need support and, uh, you know, ba there's basic things like shelter and food and health and uh, education and, um, and justice, maybe we're saying. But I think we need to sort of find how to balance these paternalistic service provision uh, forms with also um, giving people, you know, this ability to take decisions about their own lives and have a say in, in what um, in what's done with their lives. Okay, thank you for that. And I guess again, this is an aspect that plays into the development emergency continuum. Now, um, I I can't see any other hands, and I think it's uh, also important to move on. Um, as we um, want to use the remaining time to talk a little bit about the, the next steps and, and, and maybe um, start off um, with um, some that have been 
um, identified um, during the review process, and, and I'll just sort of mention some to, to get the discussion going. And, and um, again, if you have something to say uh, afterwards, please um, press on interact and, and show your hand so that we can give you the floor. Um, now, one thing that came out quite clearly is the need to develop tools and guidance around standard 14, um, both as a standalone area of programming and, 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 and one that is woven into other child protection interventions. I mean, I, meant it, I, I mentioned before that there is a lot of rules and guidance, but not really anything that um, specifically speaks to um, child protection in emergencies, or at least not very much. Um, as a second aspect is um, to increase the capacity of child protection actors and including through distance learning um, that relates specifically to justice for children in emergency settings. And in a way, this, this webinar, this first webinar is, is, is sort of a reaction to that and hopefully the first step um, in, a, in a series of webinars where we, are, uh, where we could also go into much more um, specific areas and, and, and some details that are really important and, and where there wasn't any time in this webinar today. Um, and, and obviously, to, to, to the, the other aspect is finding a way how to increase donor interest across sectors um, and in a way that the gap between development funding and humanitarian programs can be bridged. And, and, and one aspect that is connected to that is, is really adapting existing development funding in times of emergency so that it um, becomes relevant and, and can be um, really scaled up um, uh, also to, to, to respond to specific uh, issues concerning justice for children. Um, and lastly, obviously, uh, advocate for the development and support of long-term projects to um, uh, well, as I said, uh, adapt uh, and 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 be be scaled up. So the the last two really go together. So that's some of the things that have been um, previ previously um, mentioned. Maybe um, if you have um, a comment, uh, if you could um, put it in the in the chat box. Um, since the hand raising, I'm not sure if it's been working very well. So if you do have a comment or also um, something where your organization is already working on that you would like to sort of input uh, to, the, to the next phase of, of um, working on justice for children, um, please um, give your comments now and I'll hand back over to you, Joanna, for moderating this. Okay, I can't see any um, any comments in the chat box nor hands. So um, yeah, as as I said before, um, there is a um, a reference group um, of of organizations that has been working on the first phase of of this project um, during the interagency review, but also now in the follow up. Um, and um, you are invited to, to join um, this reference group to, to discuss about um, steps that should happen in, in the next phase, in the next phase that is not yet really um, clearly um, um, laid out. So um, if, uh, if you're interested, um, you can send me an email at um, m dot nagla at ibcr.org um, or respond directly to the child protection working group so i'm um, trying again to 
hand over to Joanna. I'll um, switch back to the listen only mode. And um, thank you very much from my side. All attendees are muted. Okay, to everyone that is still there, thank you very much for your attendance and um, uh, for being with us today. Um, I put my email in the chat box in case you have any questions or are interested in taking part in the next phase um, for joining the reference group. And again, the appeal to all of you um, that are working on or are in uh, the Philippines, Afghanistan, Mali or Haiti to get in touch with us for any um, information for, for the case studies. So thanks again, everyone, and um, have a good day. Thank you very much.